I want first of all to share with you that uh, your pastor, God brought this to your pastor's mind. And uh, I'm uh, far more frightened to leave home now than I was 10 years ago. This is my flesh. I, we live by his word, and if God speaks, we just move. And the Lord spoke to Pastor Wright, and, and uh, he called me and said, now, a few days ago, he said, now, I've got it on my heart for you to come down here and preach to my people, and I'll come up there and preach to yours. <laughs> well, I said, Jim. <laughs> I didn't mind him preaching to mine. In fact, I've wanted to. I've threatened him for some time to bring Jim up there. (laughs) I don't know what they're going to do. (laughs) I said to him just a few Sundays ago, I said, now what you need is Jim to preach you. (laughs) Why? They'll say, say, oh, Lord, what have we done? (laughs) You may have heard a few years ago, Peggy remembers it quite well. He came, young man, called me in 1969. I didn't know who he was. Jim had this John the Baptist way of speaking and uh, said, Brother Hope said, who's this man by the name of Lauren Ham? I didn't know who in the world I was talking to. <laughs> I said, well, brother, I said, uh, this man loved Jesus with all of his heart. And I tried to give a little history. Jim said, well, I just came from a youth convention. And he said, uh, 90% of what I heard about him was negative. But he said, I got to listen real carefully. He said, the more they talked about him, the more that I perceived he was a man of God. My response to that was, Jim Wright, or Brother Wright, as he introduced himself to me, I said, who are you and where did you come from? Because my experience had been that virtually no one once he achieves some, minister, some minister, ministerial status or recognition, here's who's a prophet and can't hardly tell the difference. I, I hardly ran into anybody. I knew that unless that man was a humble man, he could never perceive such a thing. Jesus was hardly recognized anywhere he went. That's why most of the disciples were under 30 years of age. Not one of the Sanhedrin knew who Christ was. Not one of them. Not Nicodemus and not Joseph of Arimathea. It was said of Nicodemus that he he did not receive the witness of Christ. And it may be that after all was said and done, Calvary came to pass that both Joseph and Nicodemus became disciples. Tradition says they did. One of them is said to be a secret disciple. But as far as when Jesus was on earth, they knew him not. None of them. And they were, they were the best religious people going. They're whole, they were a whole lot better than the best of our best. And so when this man spoke to me, I, I wanted to meet him. He said, now you let me know when he's at your church. He said, I want to come over there. So I called him. But before that came to pass, we went down to Brother Falwell's together. I remember the joy of the trip over and back and how we got home that night. And uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting, and I asked him if he could stay. So I said, Jim, you pray about it. Stay and preach to my people. I had about 90 on Wednesday night then. They all met on one side of the church, left side of the old church. And uh, so Jim got up, and he, he didn't know much about raising your hands or whatever have you. At least I didn't think he did, but. First thing he said, he said, let's praise the Lord. Let's just put both hands up and praise the Lord. So I never looked back because I don't know if we'd ever done it up that time. I wouldn't look back. I just got my hands up and praised God. Jim 
hesitate me, he said, I said everybody. <laughs> well, so we had a praise session. <laughs> I didn't dare ask him. I got home out of the church. I said, Jim, I said, what'd they do? He said, they praised God, just like I asked them to do. <laughs> He's a man of courage. But, but also a man of very, very tender heart. And, a, and a, a man that I highly esteem. And I, to come up here today and to touch, be in his pulpit, I had to pray. I, I've called for prayer I don't know how many times that Jesus would help me. Because he can come to my pulpit anytime God leads him. But for him to ask me to come, that we might be better acquainted. Some of you don't know much about me, but he wanted me to speak the word of God so that we would be better acquainted. And of course, I've been telling my people he was coming now for some time. So he's there. and Let's just pray a prayer for him there because I, I really want God to use Jim in the way that God, only God can use him. So let's just pray that Jesus will work with him. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this privilege of being here. Oh, what a great privilege this is. Lord, I thank you for laying it on, on Jim's heart. I thank thee. Lord, you know that it frightens me that the more I'm with my people in home, the less I want to go anywhere. And I think a pastor that loves his people like Jim and myself, we, we feel that way. But, Lord, you've spoken to Jim and uh, sent him up to my place. And Now, Lord, I'm praying that you use him up there for the, to the task for which he's been called. Because we need him very much. We've been under conviction as a congregation now for weeks, but not had a break. We had this young girl come back the other night, but, Lord, and we're thankful for her, and I pray that will strengthen her today, but... Jesus, you know how to use Jim. You know how wonderful this man is. I thank you that he's a holy man. And Father, I just pray that somehow my people will love him in such a way that he can get loose. And Lord, he can sense the freedom of God and he can be effective in the pulpit up there. Now, Lord, if we've got to pray for one or the other, we'll pray for effectiveness. It's wonderful to have freedom. But I'm praying for effectiveness. I, I would that thou would give him freedom. That's in the hands of the people. But I ask, O oh Lord, that if we have a choice to give him effectiveness with my people, and let him speak some things that I cannot speak. I pray. I wish I could speak everything, but if a man comes in as wonderful as this man, lays her down straight, it's going to help in a way that I could not have helped my people so anoint him, O Christ of God, and thank you for the sweet reception when I walked up the aisle. Instead of feeling frightened, I felt loved. Uh, there was a rumble through the crowd. I said, geez, I hope, Jim, they'll do, be as kind to him. They'll be shocked but surprised and encouraged because, Jesus, he's your servant. And how we, how we receive a servant of God is how we receive Jesus. Because the work of God, the work of God is to believe on him who has been sent of God. So be with him in a, in a wonderful way, Father. And thank you for the privilege of being here. As I look out of this audience, some of which I've been privileged to be a pastor of. I see loving responses, pleasant memories, great things of God. Thanksgiving for the grace of God. I thank thee that thou hast rescued us all. And that today... We can worship Thee and praise Thee that everybody in this place can plead the blood of Jesus Christ and be cleansed from all sin. For the Apostle John has written so wonderfully, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. O oh Lord, cleanse us. O oh God, I take a plunge. In that blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins, I take a plunge today because I need a fresh cleansing. Oh, God, I thank Thee for the blood. I thank Thee for the love of our Christ. 
I thank the God for mercy that no man knows anything about it all. Just the Trinity and me. That God's given mercy when I deserve none. I thank thee, Father, for all that thou done. That you love each of us the same. There's a grace and abundance for us all. And I rejoice over this music. I was so thrilled. It was such a sweet way that Pastor David started. It was such a sweet uh, and wonderful. I looked over and said, Jesus, what in the world? That's beautiful. Thought it sounded like Handel. And oh, how it blessed my heart. And then these young men sang like they did. I thought, oh, God, how wonderful. What a beautiful thing to worship thee in the Spirit that you can take, O oh Lord, popular, popular gospel songs, some of rhythm, or of Handel's Messiah, or some of the greatest music ever written, like O Solio Mio, and bring it right into the service this morning. Just be blessed of thee, and blessed and lift our hearts. Thank you for these appreciative people, because a lot of that depends on the openness of their hearts. Now, Jesus, I'm trusting you to help me with this sermon. Then. Well, I, hang on. Just, just love me. It may be a judgment before you hear me because in that, in that King and I, if you remember Ewell Brenner and Deborah Kerr, some of us saw it years ago when movies were clean. Some of you have never been to them. You haven't lost anything. But it, it, was, a, it was a great, it was a great uh, uh, thing. But you know, of course, it's a comedy. And, and in it, the wives praise Buddha. Well, we don't believe in praising Buddha. My wife turned to me and she said, Honey, she said, I, I don't, we haven't got the time for this. But she said, Is Jesus in this or not? Jesus, are you in it? Or are you not? Are you in my wife and my children being in this thing? Jesus says, I'm in it. I'm in it. That's awful hard on us if we're background is slightly narrow. Or a whole lot. Right, see, it just came to me to share that with you. Don't anybody rush you out and try to try out for the for the musicals and all that. Or some of them obviously are so rotten, nobody'd ever think about crossing the door to get into them. But Jesus says, I'm in it. I come from as conservative background as you and more more than most of you. But Jesus says, I'm in it. That's, that's strange. So they go and they try out. And my gracious, there's a whole bunch of tries. and like anybody's going to get it. Uh, she said, then she said, well, how about, uh, how about Ann and I? Should we try? She said, you try too. So they went up. And they all three, two of them are royal wives and one of them's a princess. I, I can tell by your quietness you still love me, but some of you wondered about me. <laughs> And that's all right, too. That's all right. Because I, have, I should prove myself. I don't know what will result out of this. But I'm telling you one thing. They've been sharing about Jesus since they've been up there. A lot of those show people have no connection with the church whatsoever. And they have honest hearts. I wish somebody could have gotten to Judy Garland while she was still singing. Somewhere over rainbow. Oh, why can't I fly? I wish somebody told her how to fly. I wish somebody loved her enough to pray hard enough to see if they were supposed to be in the band. Not in some hellish place, but in some permissible public place where God would allow it. And it got in there and said, Oh, Judy, I heard you sing years ago when you're in the Wizard of Oz. I heard your sweet voice. I heard you cry out. Did you hear in New York City on that tape that's out now when she got to that place? Why, oh, why can't I? She broke and the audience was silent and she was crying. They thought it was a great moment of entertainment. It wasn't a great moment of entertainment. It is a woman who was hungry for God and couldn't find Him. And yet we've been quick to put Him down. I don't know anything about that kind of holiness. And Jesus doesn't either. We were on a trip to India one day. I don't know where any of you with me or not. We had an old time precious, she had a precious holiness background, but she was aggravated because Tina used cigarettes. 
We got out there to that place, and here was Brother Ham. He's a holiness preacher, never had a cigarette in his mouth. He didn't even have a ring on his finger or nothing like that. Just pretty conservative, you know, and, but loves everybody. If you got a ring on or if you even got a cigarette, he'll love you. Oh, yes, sir. oh yeah, he'll love you. Well, and then we had a young multimillionaire with us who just found Jesus, and then he smoked and couldn't get rid of the habit. And Well, what are we going to do with him? Yeah. Well, we got out to this place, and these... These conservative folk, very conservative, were with us. First thing you know, they were griping and complaining about Brother Ham because he would let this woman, Roman Catholic, lead us, and she used tobacco. He didn't know that a Jewish rabbi was in her office one day, in her office, and Brother Ham walked in, and she was just using her cigarettes, and the Jewish, and she introduced us. The uh, rabbi said, I want you to meet one of God's servants. Boy, she introduced him to Brother Ham, this Roman Catholic lady that some of you know. I want you to meet... Well, that was so wonderful. Yes. It was so precious. That rabbi said to Brother Ham, why don't you tell her to stop smoking? Yeah. Brother Ham looked at him. Oh, he said, my brother said, God didn't call us to do that. He said, he called me to love this lady and her, this passport international. He said, very seldom does he ever ask me to reprove anybody, especially if they're not in my congregation or something like that. Boy, the rabbi didn't have any more to say. Oh, you know what she said? Oh, no, she said, he doesn't, he's not like that. Tina said, he loves us. He loves us just like we are. <laughs> How much better that was. Yes, sir. Sure, God didn't want us to smoke. Sure, God wants all that tobacco out of us. He, he wants that. But I'm telling you one thing. The way to win these folks is to love them with all your heart like yes, Jesus does. Yes. So, so I had this on my heart, and I was sitting there saying, oh, God, help us, because I can see we're in a place here with these folks. Help us, Jesus. I don't know what to do. About that time, John Cullum looked at me. We were in the dead of India, and Vijay Watt, he said, he said, Oliver, he said, you got something on your heart? Oh, well, I didn't want to tell what I had on my heart. <laughs> well, I said, now, Jesus, give me wisdom. I got up, and I said, let me tell you something. I want you to know I'm a holiness preacher. I want you to know I'm a fourth generation holiness fella. I've got all the background. I've got all the credentials. I've been taught what to put on, what to take off, and the whole thing. And I said, but I will tell you something. I found out that's not the definition of holiness. Boy, he just looked at me. I said, I want to give you a definition of holiness. I said, I found it while I was reading Dr. Francis Schaeffer's book called True Spirituality. And here's how he defined holiness or true spirituality. To be perfectly contented at any given moment and always thanking God. That's it right there. Yes, sir. Boy, I'm telling you, you can feel the stiffness in the place. We had any business rebuking a Roman Catholic or rebuking this multimillionaire that just come to Christ and couldn't get rid of his tobacco yet. Well, that just, see, that put disunity in the group. And we're supposed to, see, see what, is he, what is the door to any group? See, there's a door to the church, it's salvation. But what's the door to the group? Well, the only door it ought to be is the door of love. That's all. Any people that, so everybody would feel the love of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so, I gave them a definition of holiness. Think of that. You, I didn't know I was going to preach like this this morning. But I, I got to tell what Jesus is putting her from here down to here, the best known. And listen, I preach here a lot straighter than my people. I, I'm like Jim is up here. I, I'm straight down there. Because folks, I've seen enough meanness in holy and holiness people to drive people to insanity in your mouth. And I'm not letting down any standard. I believe in living the highest and the best. But I can tell you one thing. Sometimes our ideologies, see, they left him. He turned the side over here. Perhaps maybe that will lead us to the third point here. Look at this third point. But they, supposing him to have been in the journey, went a day's journey, and look. And when they saw him, they saw him among their own kinsfolk and acquaintance. They were bound by their own ideologies. They are bound by their own systems. They are bound by their own thoughts, not realizing that God is broader than most all of our thoughts. Higher, but he's broader. Well, I'll tell you, somebody told me one day, he said, wasn't even Roman Catholic saved. I said, what? No, well, it wasn't none of those priests were saved. I said, what? I said, you mean to tell me that there's 800 million Catholics in the world and God hadn't got one Catholic priest out there to preach the gospel? I don't sound like God to me. No, 
I said, I don't tell you somewhere. He loves those folks enough to save a priest real good and send him out yonder in yonder territory to preach the gospel and say, come to Jesus. I know they believe things that you and I don't believe, and I know it's hard on people, some of the doctors, but I want you to know there's some priests that love God that are preaching because God loves all people, and he's got the gospel out there. Preaching through them. We're bound by a system. We're all hung up. And especially those of us in a fellowship like this ought not to be bound by ideologies and by narrow interpretation of doctrines. I hope this don't make me a liberal. I, I'm so fill, filled up with liberalism, I don't know what to do. So don't, don't describe me to that. Dear God, I'm a praying for a conservative revival all across this country that will bring back morals and bring back good taste and bring back discipline and bring back a lot of things that's been some, been, caused us so much heartache. I'm a praying for it. But I hope that in this revival, it doesn't bring back narrowness. I hope it doesn't bring back that little old narrow way of thinking that excludes everybody, but those are in our own system. Oh, I want to be able to walk in wherever it is or turn on the radio, maybe hear a Methodist man preaching or maybe hear a Pentecostal man preaching or hearing somebody. Listen to that. I get the witness of the Spirit. I remember Pastor Wormbrand was in communist jails. He said there was Pentecostals, there was Lutherans, there was this one and there was that one, all different stripes down there. One, one man, I think several of them had only ever seen one page of the New Testament and, and, and their doctrine was atrocious. But Wormbrand said their spirit was of Jesus. You try to preach the one page of the New Testament, you're in problems. But brother, you can have one page and have a right spirit. Boy, he said, I tell you, of all the people that were the hardest to break, he said the Roman Catholics, the priests, and the nuns were the hardest to break. That's what he said. He said they couldn't get them. He said they just hung in there and hung in there and hung in there and, and served Jesus and praised God. And of course, in, in communist prisons, there's no denominations. You're either for God or, 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 or you're not for him, and you can't even be a hypocrite because there's not enough strength to make a profession. I remember he said, well, we were all happy in prison. said, the communists were happy. They beat us. They were happy, and we were happy preaching. We preached and got beat and, and said just everybody was happy. No hypocrites. Well, we got to find him. We left him behind. Sometimes we get so preoccupied with the journey, with the cares of this life, and isn't this common to us? We're traveling along, and I, I see it ha- happening so much in my people. I think when a man can miss church and go to work the next day, and it happens repeatedly and repeatedly, that he's got a wrong spirit. And I've said to my people, if you're going to miss anything, miss work and come to church. <laughs> Be faithful, for this is the most important. I, I, I think of how many of us are so stingy in nature with our money. Boy, I pray God will give us a... Uh, a spirit of liberty that we'll be given so much in the next few weeks and the next few months that God will have to have a stop. Like in the Old Testament when one of the priests, Nehemiah, one of them said, bring your offerings in. They brought them in and the prophet said, stop, that's enough. I, I've never had to do that, only with two people in my church. One was Dave Anderson, the little Baptist preacher. I said, David, you're giving too much. The Holy Spirit said, you, you drop your giving. You're, you're giving way too much. Think of that. Another person. I've never asked people personally to give more, but I've asked two of them to give less. Because they, they got so happy in Jesus that they didn't have enough for the family to live on. They were giving tithes and 20% and 30%. I got people giving 30%. I'll tell you one thing, Maranatha Fellowship this morning. I hope, I hope you love Jesus so much. That, that little green back there hasn't got a hold of your soul. I hope you're so liberal that God Almighty has to send you an angel tell you stop giving so much. It's, it's really something. That's where it really shows up right there. So preoccupied with the journey, preoccupied in inflation, setting in all that, and God owned the cattle on a thousand hills. So, bro, we don't have quite enough money here. We'll ask him to find that hill that's for Maranatha. Sell all them cattle and get it in. You remember, you remember the story of how that man at Drew University, old brother H.A. Ironside, an old spirit-filled Calvinist, Man, Drew University was about to go under. That was back in the days when the glory was upon the Calvinists and on the Methodists. 
And when they weren't fighting with each other and anybody filled with Jesus wasn't fighting with each other and were about to lose the school and Drew University was about to go under and oh, the old godly H.A. Ironside was down in knees praying. He said, oh God. He said, I pray, Lord, you'll find those cattle and sell them and pay the debts off of this school. While he was praying, a woman, his secretary came in and slipped a check right in his lap like that. While he, just before he started his prayer, was in his prayer meeting, an old tall Texan walked into the office and he's about half mad. Put that check on, uh, on the desk of the secretary and said, here. He said, I just sold two carloads of cattle and I can't get any peace till I give this money to this school and walk right out. <laughs> He said he'd hear us before we speak. Yes, sir. Answer our prayers before we call. And there he'd started that cattleman with his cattle on the way to the market, probably a trainload of uh, rich cattle rancher, and he had two car loads sold for Junior University and paid every debt they had that day. Praise God. You know how they found him? It says here, and when they found him not, isn't that wonderful? They found him not. They turned back again to Jerusalem. Now look at the Greek here says, anxiously seeking him. Anxiously seeking him. That's it. Boy, it's more than just to come in church. It's more than a half-hearted attempt at devotions. It's more than a parade of religion. I tell you, there is such a desire, a desire in our hearts. I think it was expressed by the prophet when he said, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search with me for me with all your hearts. When we search for him with all our heart, they turn back anxiously seeking him. Not doing 101 things. Listen, when, when Brother Paul and Daddy lost Brian, they didn't even have time for apple cider. Yet you and I are on our way to church or on our way to church sometime and we decide maybe we'll do this or maybe we'll do that. When we lost Brian, I couldn't even eat after it was all over. That little old boy but losing Jesus was more important than losing my boy. So much so that ever all of my children that have been born, I've been privileged to lay my hands on them. I still do it. Went in the other night, did the same thing. While I laid my hand, I said, Jesus, I want to ask you something. I said, I've never asked anything for my children. I never asked fine things. I never asked education. I've never asked Jesus, but I asked one thing. I asked in the name of Christ that my child loved Jesus with all of his heart. That's all. That's all I'm asking for. And I said, and then I asked you one more thing. Lord, if you could see if they reach the age of accountability and they're going to be lost, I said, kill them now. Amen. Amen. Boy, I see parents come to me saying, I said, pray for my child, pray for my baby. What do, you, what do you want prayed for? Well, I want you to pray they'll be healed. What about their souls? Maybe God wants them to go on. Maybe you haven't had a good enough background uh, to keep the discipline up in such a way that there'll be certain things seeping there and cause that child to err. Have you got the grace of God enough in your heart to say, Lord, I want my child's salvation more than I want anything else? Yeah. And see, this very day, I've been able privilege to lay my hands to Jesus. Naomi is so sweet. She's so precious. I love her so much. But Jesus, here she is right here. I love her, and I want her in heaven. So, Jesus, if you can see that this old world is going to get her, I want you to take her now. Lord, here's Brian, 16 years old, in our Christian school this year, played basketball for the first time, but had an had a awful hard time in public school. Lord, here's Brian. That Jesus, i prayed for him ever since he's been little. I ask in the name of Jesus that I would save this boy, help him to love Jesus with all of his heart, and, Lord, if you could see that he's not going to, would you take him and take him right soon? Lord, here's Ann. She's 18 years old. I don't know where the age of accountability is, but when they were in the wilderness, that age was 20. I don't know where it is. It was 12, 14, 16, but in, but in the wilderness, it was 20. The, the, the congregation of Israel sinned against God, and he punished all that were accountable. Those under 20 lived to go in under Joshua in, into, the, into the Canaan land. But what's so bad about them going in, they got infected with the same disease that their parents had. Breaks my heart. I remember the great black evangelist in the, in the uh, great black evangelist by the name of Amanda Black, who was a great evangelist in the Civil War a hundred years ago in our history and a little more. And how that God had given her a precious baby. One night the baby was sick unto death almost. And she was praying over the baby and finally God spoke to her and said, Amanda, ask what you will, I'll give it to you. Amanda looked back at Jesus. She said, Jesus, she said, I dare not. 
what is your will for this child? She put the child right back in the precious arms of Jesus. She prayed further and the Lord spoke again and said, Amanda, ask what you will. Even the life of the child, I'll give it to you. She said, oh Lord, I dare not hear. She said, Jesus, do what you will. And the third time the voice of God came to her and said, Amanda, ask what you will. I'll give you the child if you want it. Amanda said, oh God, I dare not ask for this child. Lord, what is your will? I give her to thee. And the child died. I want that kind of religion. Amen. That's the kind I want. I want the kind of religion that's got eternal values inside. I can see the king of glory and I can see over the portals of glory. I can see where it really counts. That's the kind I want. I don't want this kind that's so covetous. I'd rather have my children and see them get on dope or see them lost to this world or lost in the things of this world and die and go to hell. I don't want, I want to be able to walk into the glory with all my family with me. Amen. Either to greet them or have them greet me when I come through the pearly gates. And I know that unless I'm anxiously seeking Him with all my heart, unless I'm really after Him with all my heart, I've lost Him. And in so doing, I've lost my family. I've lost all that really counts. This is all that counts. Aren't we discovering it now? The old words beginning to shake. Inflation's about to take us out. Famine's coming, so uh, the economists say, and some of God's prophets here we are waiting on God. What in the world are we going to do? It's time that you and I centered our attention upon Jesus. Yes, it's time that we examine ourselves to see whether or not He's with us or whether we're just in the supposing business. Oh, how wonderful it is to have Jesus. The other night, Friday night prayer meeting, I was preaching on the 51st Psalm. Dear God, I, how in the world I was going to do it. 51st Psalm, where David went into Bathsheba and had Uriah killed. Oh, Lord, I said, Jesus, how in the world am I going to do it and keep my people encouraged because David's in such a fix here. But, oh, Jesus, help me. Pastor Steve came in and prayed for me. I got out on my knees an hour before prayer meantime. He asked Jesus to help me. The Holy Ghost said, I'm going to help him. He said, I'll show him what to do while he's up preaching. So I began to read the Psalm. I remember going in. The first words I said was, Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry, God. That's the name. That's the real name of the psalm. I'm sorry, God. Create a right spirit within me and give me back a steadfast spirit. Let me have the sacrifices that are acceptable unto thee. Those sacrifices are that of a broken and contrite spirit. God give it to me. Somehow, in the great wonder of it all, I got lost. And my, and my people got lost too. I preached an hour and 15 minutes and nearly everybody thought it was 15 minutes. My bro- I'll tell you this and I'll try to close about having the presence of Jesus with us. Back years ago, when we were little boys and dad and mom's home, of course, we used to lay down at night and sometimes dad and mom would leave us to have our own devotions and I, of course, was the preacher. I was two years older than Terry and Ronnie and I was sort of a, an authority figure and I sort of directed the devotions, you know. And uh, so I'd say, boys, we're going to have devotion. I said, now, uh, well, they couldn't read Scripture, so I'd say, well, you, you quote what you know. And they'd quote their little Scriptures, and we'd have Scripture time. Then I'd say, um, Ronnie, you sing a little song. Or let's all sing together. We'd sing, uh, just little boys. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Seven years old, five years old, and four years old. Thank you, Lord. Or making me whole. She was lying on her beds in the bedroom there, Portageville, Missouri, 506 King Avenue. We didn't know that oftentimes Mother and Daddy would come to the door and listen to us having devotions. We didn't know that until we was grown up. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so full and free. And then I remember singing these little old squeaky voice boy, boys. My brother Terry can't hardly carry a tune. And it was a sight. Mama tried to get us to sing We Three Kings of Orient Art Christmas time and Terry's voice would crack and get off. And we were just little, didn't know him. We'd say, Mama, Terry's off again. And, but here we were, all together in our bedroom, we're singing, Thank you, Lord. And we'd say, I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord will make a way for me. Think of little boys singing like that. If I live a holy life, Shun the wrong and do the right. I know the Lord will make a way for me. My brother Terry, who's with me now, as you know, was sitting right over here. He works at Harless Printing. He's right, sitting right over here. And then I got to the place 
where I used to say, well, Terry, it's your time to testify. Terry was over there. He was lost. This happened 30 years ago. He was lost. I'm talking about the presence of Jesus. I'm talking about not losing Jesus. I'm talking about having more than a supposing involved. I'm talking about waiting on him and looking to him and worshiping him and walking with him. Boy, my brother Terry was over there. I was telling him about what happened 30 years ago. And I got to that point where I would say, now, Terry, you testify. And so I said, Terry, testify. And the, Terry was sitting right over there. And when I said that, the power hit him. He jumped right straight up, hollered at the top of his voice. I looked around. I just, I said, think of it. 30 years ago, he would testify when I'd ask him to. And now he's a young man, 40, or a middle-aged man, 40 years old. And listen at him. He's testifying now. He was lost in the wonder and the glory of God because he remembered that when we were boys, Jesus used to visit our room. The boys would go off to sleep and I'd, I'd lay down and I'd look at the ceiling. I'd say, Jesus, I feel you. Jesus, I, it sure is wonderful. Jesus, I feel you. Sometimes I'd wake up in the night and see a large light. I didn't know if it was an angel or Jesus. I just knew that it was of God. I see a large light. I've seen that light. Even in Scott Depot in the old parsonage when you lived across the... I have seen that light one night. I woke up one night. I've always wanted to see angels. I've always wanted to see Jesus in vision. I woke up one night. I said, oh, there was a light right over me like that. I said, Jesus, is that you? Jesus, have you come to talk to me? That'd be like light right there. And just fade away. One of these days, she's not going to fade. I'll find out who that is. I don't know if that's my guardian angel or what that is, but I've wakened and seen that light right over me. Wake right up. I said, oh, it's so wonderful. One night I said, just not long ago in the house where we live now, I don't Hurricane Creek. I said, Jesus, is that you, Jesus? Is this the night that you're going to talk to me? He talks to me. He witnesses in my heart. He has mercy and grace on me, but I'd like for him to come sit on my bed and talk to me. If that gives you theological problems, you just have to have them. I still want it. I don't have any theological problems over Oral Roberts seeing Jesus 200 foot, foot, foot tall. He's a whole lot taller than that. When he wants to appear in vision, that's no problem to me. Whether he's 20 foot tall or 200 foot tall, I mean in vision, he's liable to be whatever. Mother Barr saw him when we was traveling over the ocean. Mother Ball saw him holding our plane up. She saw him with his feet on the ocean and he was holding the plane up. She saw him. She saw him in vision. By the way, her husband died just a few hours ago. Leonard's gone on to glory, this great servant of God. But you see, there we were, and I'd see Jesus. I'd say, oh, God, it's so wonderful. I'd get so happy till I'd get out of my bed. I'd slip out. Boys were asleep, and I'd go in by the foot of Mom and Dad's bed. Mom and Daddy? Yeah, yes, son. Maybe they'd be in twilight zone or even asleep. Daddy, I just want to tell you, I feel Jesus so wonderful. See, I'm just seven years old. I feel God... And Dad, I just want to tell you how wonderful it is to be a Christian. I just want to tell you, Mama, how glad I am that y'all are ministers of God and that you've taught me about the things of Jesus. And I'm just so happy. I just didn't know hardly what to do. Well, my folks always responded right. Well, son, we're, we're mighty thankful you're happy. Why, well, maybe the glory would subside just a little bit. I go back and lay back down in my bed and I try to sleep. Well, but it just Jesus had come. I feel so good. I say, oh God, you feel so wonderful. Jesus, I'm so thankful. I get back up and say, Daddy, I just. I didn't want to bother you anymore, but I just want to talk a little more about Jesus. Could I just tell you a little more how I feel? Boy, my dad says, son, you just keep talking. Mom and I can sleep later. You just tell us what you feel. This happened in my boyhood days a number of times. Or, or if I had lost him. Now get this and I'll try to close. Or if I had lost him. Maybe I said something awful to the teacher or maybe I hadn't done right or I lied to mama or done something. You know how it is. He'd get out of kelter even as a little child. Done something wrong. I'd lay down and try to go to sleep. Boy, that thing had come up before me. I didn't want to die in the night. I, did, I thought it was a silly prayer when I was little, but I don't think it's a silly, silly now. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If you ain't got anything else to pray, this is good. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's a good prayer. That's a good prayer. I said, oh Lord, in, in a sense, I want to be able to pray that. And so I... Oh, and I'd see that. I'd, I hadn't, I'd done something wrong. I'd spoken wrong to Mom. So i get up and i go back to the the bed. I'd say, Mom and Daddy, maybe be asleep. Tug at the feet. Mama, yes, son. Mama, I want you to forgive me. This happened to me when I was six years old, seven years old, eight years old, nine years old. Mama, Daddy, I just can't go to sleep this morning. Would you forgive me? Would you have a little prayer with me? What's the matter with me? 
I'd lost the sense. I'd lost the sweet feeling of Jesus. I'd lost the hand of His approval. I had to go in and get it straight. And something had come between me and my folks. And I wanted Him back. Because once you've got a taste of God, there's nothing like it. Oh, I tell you, we can live in His glory and never get hungry. People have been sustaining communist prisons for months on end without hardly anything just because they were in His glory and God would come in supernaturally and feed them. Daddy, I'm sorry. Oh, Daddy, forgive me. Oh, Mama, forgive me. And I'll tell you one more incident. I remember it now. When I was on my, on my bed about 15 years of age and I had the old-fashioned flu and my bones began to ache and began to hurt and oh, I was so sick that my Daddy would rub my limbs for about three nights, morning, day and night. If He didn't rub me, I'd almost scream. If you haven't had the old-fashioned flu, you don't know what it's like. You get this hurt in your bones. You can understand a little bit about what David said in the, in the Psalms about his bones feeling rotten and being crushed. It's a terrible thing. And when, when I got down under conviction, it's wonderful how conviction can come upon you and God will work with you and reprove you. And then I saw that I'd said something wrong. You know what it was? The biggest sin I can remember at that time, I made, a fun of, I made fun of a Sunday school teacher who pronounced Africa, Africa. I didn't know there was people going to be as important as John Kennedy. Talk, John Kennedy would talk that way too. I just thought that's country. He said, had a little ugly spirit. So I'd talk about Sister Krause and I'd say, Africa. Boy, I tell you, when the, when, the, when the sickness hit me, I came up right before me. That snotty spirit was right there. And I said, and I heard about a day and a half. I hated to call him. Finally, I said, Daddy, I said, I don't know if God's going to kill me or what he's going to do, but I said, I'll tell you one thing. You get all these people in, everybody I could think of. I'd say, hang in. I said, you get them in here. I'm about to die. <laughs> Boy, I mean, they, here they came. One right after the other. I said, I want you to forgive me, so and so. I, want, I said, I trust God. I'll never do that again. Would you forgive me? And I got Sister Krause. And I said, Sister Krause, and would you forgive me for making fun of the way you pronounce Africa? Africa? She said, I'll do it. After they all left, and I cleared up everything I could clear up because I wanted to sweep. If I'm going to die, I want to die with his presence. Bones aching or not. And after they left, I said, well, Daddy, my bones are hurting, but I said, my heart's happy. I'm ready. God's going to take me. Let him take me, but I'm clear with God. Hallelujah. I didn't want to lose him. I don't want to lose him today. And I'm sorry over the way I've been. I'm sorry that my heart's been too hard. I'm sorry that I haven't been a better pastor. I'm grieved about it. I'm grieved that I'm more than 40 years, eight, 40 years of age and not what God really wants me to be. It about broke my heart when I traveled two years ago and I turned 40. I said, oh, I'm in misery over the fact that I'm 40. I'm not, I'm not what God wants me to be. But a cry like that can bring help. So today, the people of God have reason to be grieved. Causing so many times we've left him.